Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Tom Rocchio, practice in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of give you a shotgun of external fixation, and what I'm going to try and do is show how uh, not just external fixation, but how SEAL makes it a lot easier. And um, a lot of the cases that I'm going to show are all cases that uh, have been done with other systems, but how I use the SEAL system and what my philosophy is and why I do uh, what I do. So going back with Sharko, one of our biggest uh, external fixation indications, uh, going back to this case in 2006, it was definitely in my residency program under Laporta when we started to do a lot more with active Sharko reduction. Uh, we could have a great Sharko symposium, uh, and, and one day I'm, I'm gonna push Nick to do that, uh, where we get up here and then we argue with each other for hours and yell about how the other guy doesn't know what they're doing and get a lot of education on how to treat Sharko. But the way that I started to do it back then and what I continue to do is when I grab my active Sharkos, I will stabilize them immediately. Um, whether or not they have significant breakdown or not, if I know this patient's in active Sharko, I want to stabilize them in external fixation. When I have an extreme case like this where the patient has a one-day history, they're getting tissue hypoxia not from external to internal pressure like we see with our pressure ulcers, but from such a large deformity where we're getting tissue hypoxia from these bones dislocating and causing tissue death inside to out pressure. If this patient was taken and, and placed into a total contact cast and, and told to be non-weight bearing, they would have pretty much a near degloving and all this tissue would die away and we'd be dealing with a uh, below the knee amputation. So in 06, we took uh, this, this x-ray, and I love this x-ray. These, these are the bag of bones presentations. All the bones are fully visible. There's no dusting of any of your bones, but they're all uh, in this bag of bones and, uh, and dislocated. So at the time, I took the rings that then became the right medical rings that were from R&R Medical, and I took some old Depew struts, and I was able to build this miter-type frame. The one thing I want to point out, little pearl, crossing half pins in the calcaneus. Uh, at 45 degrees to 90 degree angle, this is stronger than utilizing tensioned wires, even tensioned olive wires. When we look at biomechanical studies, the 1600 papers that were written on biomechanics and strength of rings was translated to the foot plate and we found out in 2004 at Texas Scottish Rite Hospital, we did a research pr uh, presentation and project there and in Foot and Ankle, in Foot and Ankle International 2004, 2005, there was a great article that came out that showed the foot plate does not act like a ring. And, um, and that, you know, I won't go in any, any more into that, but that's a great read for if you're a nerd. So uh, what I was able to do with this patient, and I'm not looking for anatomic reduction, I'm looking for distraction, and it arrests that Charco event. So with this patient, the erythema went away immediately with distraction. And again, this is not the way I'd leave that patient. Uh, little bump in the road, this patient was as adherent as all my Charco patients. He came in walking on the frame. Uh, if you're an old Seinfeld fan, it looked like Kramer's special shoes, that, that episode where he comes in with those shoes, and the guy's got his walker and he's walking on this, this miter frame and it's bouncing and he broke some pins and dislocated his metatarsals dorsally, but we were able to easily reset him. I love showing the end result. A lot of times we see lectures on different treatments for Charcot and different treatments for pretty advanced cases, and we never see that patient down the road. So that was, this is that same patient years down the road. His foot looks like a foot again, and he's in a normal sneaker, and that's always my goal. Uh, a lot of times we could take these active Charcot patients, distract them, and if it's not a massive deformity dislocation, but just multiple fractures, we're able to get these patients reduced, distracted, reduced, and we don't need to do any further work like we had to with the last patient. So this is a very common frame that I'm utilizing now. It looks very similar to that makeshift frame that I used on that last patient, but this is what I'm using today, and this is all seal products. What we're gonna do in the lab and what we're gonna be able to uh, show you is a two ring tibial block that I apply to the patient. I then will have my floating foot plate that I'll fixate many times with that crossing half pins. Uh, it is to note that if I'm gonna go back in and do any big reconstructive work, I will use uh, half pins and olive wires uh, or olive wires, depending on if I need to take a lot of bone graft, I sometimes take it from calcaneus, not so much with my diabetic patients, but always be conscious of what you're gonna do in the future and don't destroy anatomy that's, clear, that's clean and clear that you're gonna potentially use later. So this particular patient, uh, we were able to distract all his fractures uh, consolidated and he has a foot that looks like a foot and it doesn't look like he ever had Charcot. 
the best thing is this was probably three and a half months to back in and shoe and stable, and the guy scumbagged me on Facebook. Oh, is this being recorded? <laughs> so, uh, so the guy goes on Facebook on one of those Sharko sites. Uh, you know, you can look at those Sharko sites, but please don't respond. Uh, they're gonna, the, nobody's gonna ever take your words of wisdom the right way, and you're gonna always be misinterpreted. But uh, yeah, this patient goes out there and says, oh, this is taking forever, I hate this, blah, blah. And, uh, and someone said, you should find another doctor. Who's your doctor? And I'm, and I'm looking at this going, I can't believe this. this is the best result ever. I don't think anybody could do a better job, and, and there's a lot of great surgeons out there. It's just a great healing case, and the guy's killing me on Facebook, and uh, just says something funny. I'm following it, and uh, Dr. Vito, it was before I really uh, uh, got to meet him, he, he, uh, he came to my defense, and, and it was kind of a funny thing to see here. The patient came in and said, you know what, Dr. Vito? So, Facebook. Uh, bent wire technique, you can still utilize the principles of external fixation, and one of the, uh, one of the uh, principles I love is bent wire technique to get compression. Uh, performing a very tough surgery where we have to remove the talus, so the talus has been destroyed through shark or trauma, uh, tibial calcaneal arthrodesis. The, the trouble is always this tibial to navicular or tibial to uh, uh, tailor neck fusion. And if you can utilize good stime and pin fixation and bent wire technique, I think that's the best fixation in utilizing a circular frame, obviously. And if you, uh, if you get a good result, you can have a result that will look like this. I want you to know that if you perform this on a Charcot patient and you have a quarter inch radiolucency through here, but the calcaneus is fixated to the tibia and that rear foot is underneath the tibia, then you're, you've just performed a successful surgery. And I don't want you to think that you're some failure because there's some hypermobility at that, at that forefoot that patient now has a foot that's not gonna go into a rocker bottom foot and they're not gonna re-ulcerate and that was successful. And I'd probably say that you're looking at 70% chance of not having a successful fusion here and that's not a failure. So the butt frame is another uh, technique. You'll see often this, this two ring tibial block. There are uh, a couple of my hospitals that I work out of that have no resonance. Very difficult when you're working with external fixation. With this technique of applying this two ring tibial segment and then applying individually the foot plate segment and the forefoot segment, you can do these procedures by yourself, maybe with a scrub tech hand in your things, and it's not something that's gonna take hours and hours. I showed you bent wire technique to compress. This is bent wire technique. You can see some bowing in that, in that wire there and distraction at this TN Charco. Same type of presentation where I have Charco deformity at the mid tarsal joint. I'll distract that patient. We'll keep them in that distracted position. Uh, when the frame comes off, I'll then compress, make sure they heal up their pin and wire sites. And then a few weeks later, if I have to do any type of internal fixation, that's when I'll go back in and do that. And sometimes those patients will end up with an X fix again. In a case where you have a patient that should get a below the knee amputation, massive osteomyelitis, chronic ulceration, uh, you can now have options where you can go in and resect all non-viable bone. You, you really need to do something that Guido taught me back in my residency. You need to divorce your debridement from your reconstruction when you're dealing with these high-risk patients. If you're gonna perform a limb salvage, but you're saying, I'm gonna leave this questionable bone because I don't know if I can reconstruct this later, you're gonna have failures, you're gonna have recurrent infections, and you're not gonna get the result you want. So this particular aggressive case, we had to resect all the bad bone. Uh, backflow with some uh, calcium phosphate mixed with tobramycin in this case. Uh, showing good external fixation, stabilization of that, of that patient as they healed their soft tissue injury, and then uh, we're very easily able to go back in and do our rear foot fusion. Again, stabilize that rear foot under the leg, and just because he has this hypermobility and stability at the midfoot, if I can stabilize that, that rear foot under the tibia, 90% of the work is there, and this patient is now uh, having no problems and able to ambulate in a crow boot. There's going to be uh, talk coming up about small rail systems. So even though this is a really cool case of a really old fracture, I'll just fly through it. Uh, 40 year old, uh, 40 years of trauma. He had a subtalar joint fusion and ankle fusion, but left him in a horrible varus deformity. The, the fibula wasn't resected, so he had this prominent fibula that was almost weight bearing. So I love to draw out my angles uh, with styman pins. It helps my residents make that osteotomy. You can see we made that osteotomy. We, we, we handled also an increased lever arm that was left of this patient. He was too anteriorly fused. So I was able to, to posteriorly translate after we closed down this, uh, this wedge that we took out, held with styman pins, uh, transosseous four millimeter 
uh, pins that we're going to be able to play with in the lab. And uh, then we had this patient with his frame on and showing uh, great reduction. It's not perfect, but it's close enough. And there's that patient after and there's the x-ray after. So this uh, uh, older patient that had this deformity that was just pain every, every, every time he took a step, it, it led to uh, progressing mid-tarsal uh, mid arthritis. You, you always hear that. You fuse an ankle joint, you're going to have knee issues, you're going to have subtalar issues. Well, that's really true when you have subtalar and ankle fusion at the level of the mid-tarsal joint, and that's why this patient needed a mid-tarsal fusion as well. Uh, again, I'm not going to go too much into small rail. We're going to see that. Speed frame, I think Dr. Rizzo is going to talk about that, but uh, Dr. Vito showed it. Great way to reduce fractures quickly. This lady was incredibly high risk. If you look at this before x-ray, you could see that this was not her first rodeo. Uh, she got wheeled into the, uh, the ED. Now, normally, I don't get this call, but she got wheeled into the ED screaming, get me Rocky O, I want Rocky O. And I got the call at, uh, I think it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and that was a fun case. Uh, me and Nick, actually, uh, because of uh, sterilization issues, had to wait until 6 o'clock in the morning. So uh, that, was a, that was a good night hanging out in the diner waiting for that case to be ready. And uh, this was reduced. We were able to get her in that frame. She kept that frame on for eight months. She was able to ambulate, live her life uh, for eight months before we got consolidation. Let's see if we can get this video to play just to show how you can really ambulate these patients. These are frames that meet anatomy. Dr. Rizzo shows this wonderfully uh, with his uh, trauma presentation. But this, this frame and the, the theme of the rest of these lectures are going to be no compromise when it comes to anatomic fixation. If you need to fixate at a certain angle through a certain segment of bone, you're going to be able to fixate in that area, and the frame will not limit you, it will help you. And, uh, and that is going to be seen greatly with the small rail system. A lot of times you use small rails and uh, mini rails, and you have to apply your pins uh, parallel or converging based on the cars. With this system, you throw your pins first. It's the only system that really allows you to throw your pins first through optimal anatomy, and the rail system will capture that pin and be able to stabilize them. There's a quick case here showing the trauma, showing reduction. We could play with this in the lab. Uh, a lot of times we break tip fibs, put on our speed frame, and we're able to easily reduce. And I recommend doing that in the lab today. We have, uh, we have 20 cadavers that are not fractured, and we have eight that are. The first lab, there'll be no fractures. But as we progress through the day, we can break out the fracture ones. And if you guys, we can convert to a fracture. No, that's terrific. And, and you really see that when you get fractures like this, and if, uh, if you're a trauma surgeon, if you're a delta frame uh, uh, female or male, you're going to love uh, this speed frame. And, uh, and you can see the reduction you're able to get. So you've got other products are like this car, and this is the seal. I'm going to have to upgrade this. This is from uh, Zurich, Switzerland, in the hotel uh, lobby. This is a Maybach, so it's nice. Um, Pediatrics. This frame, again, is very easy to use with pediatrics, when, especially when you need to do gradual correction. So we have an Aquinas correction. Uh, just for history's sake, uh, we throw up the old Elizaroff uh, model frame, and what we're usually dealing with is not only anterior motors, but also posterior motors and hinges. Uh, Nick actually built this frame. The, the owner of SEAL, Nick, is, uh, is incredibly knowledgeable on his device and also other companies' devices and three-dimensional spacing. You might not know it by looking at him, but he's, he's really, really smart with this stuff. And I actually will talk to him about what I'm looking for, and he will build frames that are almost right on what I want. And it's, it's, it's pretty special to have that type of relationship. So he will uh, he'll align the hinges. He understands the ankle joint range of motion. And, uh, and these are the frames that, uh, that he's able to build so strong that I'm able to have one single motor anteriorly for this child. It makes it so much easier for parents to do those daily corrections with an anterior motor and not two posterior motors. Uh, did this case at that hospital that has no help. This guy was no help. Um, I did this whole case by myself and uh, I was able to put this on in a bloodless procedure and uh, half a millimeter a day correction on this patient. Uh, last case I'm going to show, then I'll let you guys take over. It, this, this is many times what I'm doing with my limb salvage cases, especially if I'm sitting alone without resident help. So. I think looking at this picture, that's a, that's a leg in a basket in most, most cases. But uh, what we were able to do is give this gentleman a chance. So full aggressive debridement, separating that debridement from my planned reconstruction. I don't leave anything that looks bad. 
and, uh, and it was almost this whole tarsal uh, segment. I then applied my two ring tibial block. A lot of times if, if you put on external fixation frame like many of you had and you have your pre-built frame, one of the toughest things, and I always tell my residents, one of the hardest jobs and the most important job is that resident that's holding the leg and holding the frame uh, in alignment with the, with the leg and the tibia and, and more importantly the foot. That, that's no longer necessary if you use this technique. I can apply that two ring tibial block and even if it's a little bit angled, you're all right because all of those multi-action hinges and especially that collet, but ball and collet joint, are gonna allow you to put that foot anywhere you need to inside that uh, and stabilize with that tibial ring block. So two rings, that's why you double glove. I then drop my foot plate, connect it with my crossing four millimeter or five millimeter half pins. I'm able to take this patient out of Aquinas, just like the speed frame, varus valgus correction, Aquinas correction, lock it in place, and then I'm able to fixate my forefoot. And this is that patient's x-ray immediately post-operative. You got a lot of the tarsal bones are resected, but the foot looks like a foot again. It's plantar grade. Good image here of where your pin should look like in the forefoot. And this was that patient four days later. Used acellular dermal graft. That'll granulate in nicely. The frame now has uh, ultimate stability. That would be great for wound care as well. Uh, you can use a vacuum dressing. This is just uh, that paper if you're ever interested in reading about that Foot and Ankle International 2004. I'm not going to go into minis. You're going to see minis at great length. But triple arthrodesis, uh, one of my passions with these minis. And we're going to review uh, good pin placement in the lab. And it just shows great range of motion. And I think, I think that I've said enough.